I'd like to welcome everyone back. Uh, hope you enjoyed your break. And uh, we'll just be beginning, be beginning with our final panel before the ambassador's speech. And uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Christopher Whitney, who will be moderating this panel. And uh, he'll take it from there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm Christopher Whitney. I'm the Executive Director for Studies at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And it's a pleasure to be with you today on this uh, very glorious afternoon um, to talk about an issue that I personally consider to be one of the, the most pressing international problems we face today, and that is the issue of democracy, governance, and war in uh, oil exporting nations. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel with us to uh, talk about that, and we'll, I'll quickly turn it over to them, but I just wanted to say a few words about this issue. Uh, I find it to be very uh, significant for, for a variety of reasons. I, it touches on a wide range of, of critical international issues ranging from energy dependence uh, and security to geostrategic stability, uh, resource competition between great powers, and even to uh, the emerging need to look at alternative renewable sources of energy to help mitigate against uh, climate change. And uh, it has increasingly become an important issue in the last few years with the very significant rise in oil prices uh, at a global level, which have produced revenue windfalls uh, for a variety of oil-dependent countries in the developing world. And quite a few of these countries have not used uh, this money very productively. Uh, in many cases, they have uh, used it as a lever to uh, either ignore calls for the development of democratic institutions and governance models, or in some instances, even to roll back uh, the existence or the e e uh, efficiency of existing institutions within those countries. And uh, this democracy deficit has been coupled with a development deficit in quite a few of these countries. Uh, they just simply have not been investing the money uh, in productive ways. Um, and in fact, many of them suffer uh, compared to non-oil dependent countries in the developing world in terms of a variety of economic indicators. And this combination of, of a lack of democracy and a lack of development is really a, a very impressing international issue and it's greatly complicated by the fact that the United States and a variety of multilateral and international actors have diminished ability to exercise influence over these countries because of their added oil revenue and also because of the relationships they have developed with emerging uh, economic powers such as China and India, which uh, have diminished our ability to either guide them in, as they develop or even to ensure that they act as responsible members of the international community and, and we see that very prominently with what's happening in the Sudan and Iran. And with that, I'm very pleased to be here today and to be with these three speakers to, to talk about this issue in greater depth and to, to look at the convergence or lack of convergence between uh, democracy and development uh, and uh, it's particularly in these, in these countries. Uh, we're gonna start off with two PowerPoint presentations. Uh, the first is by Professor Terry Lynn Carl, who is the Gilder Professor in Latin American Studies and Professor of Political Science at Stanford. That will be followed by uh, a second presentation by Professor Miriam Lowy, who's the Visiting Research Scholar at Princeton's Institute for the Trans-Regional Study of Contemporary Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia. It's a very long title. And followed and concluded by uh, Professor Kevin Sway, who is the Assistant Professor of Economics at Clemson University. And with that, I will turn it over to you. This really isn't a PowerPoint presentation as much as it is showing you little pieces of my former PowerPoint presentation. And I changed a little bit in part because um, we're we're here thanks to the students who invited us, and I really want to thank all of you. This has been the most impressive, uh, Jeff and Chris and others, Kyle, others. It's been a really impressive uh, conference that you've put together. But I think that what I decided to do instead of showing you lots of data was to try to put a bit of a human face on um, the debate that I see in 
oil today. And I, I need to go back by saying that uh, I first got interested in oil because the founder of OPEC, Juan Pablo Perez Alfonso, a very noted Venezuelan, uh, looked at me at one point and said, Terry, why don't you study what oil is doing to us? And I said, he was pointing at Venezuela, and I said, what do you mean, Don Juan Pablo? And he said, es el excremento del diablo. Oil is the devil's excrement. And I have not been able to get that phrase out of my mind for a very long time. Uh, and I wanted to bring it up to you because I'm feeling a little bit of a disconnect at this conference and it may, uh, and I wanted to say how I see that disconnect. On the one hand, we are hearing a series of presentations that say there's a lot of energy out there, um, we can, there's a lot of technological advances, the market is going to resolve this, we have a, a little bit, the U.S. government can't do very much, and so it's going to be business as usual, and we're okay through 2030. And then on the other hand, we have some people saying, what about climate change? And now I'm going to say, uh, what about people living in oil exporting countries, and what is happening in, in countries in a moment of transition from easy to find relatively cheap oil to more difficult to find and more expensive oil. And I want to start by just telling you uh, a story of something that happened to me in my office hours at Stanford. And that is I went and opened the door of my office hours, big long line of students standing outside, and in the middle of them there was this indigenous man, elderly man, completely in what I knew to be Latin American indigenous outfit, um, lots of um, jewelry made out of seeds, etc. And I walked right up to him because he didn't, it, well, he didn't fit the profile of my students. And I said, you know, excuse me, uh, can I help you? And he looked at me, couldn't understand me. And then finally someone else came up and said, I need to translate. He only speaks Uwa which I have subsequently learned is only a verbal language. There is no written language. He had come from the cloud forests of Colombia. And uh, in my office hours, he walked in and through an interpreter explained to me that he was the chief spiritual leader of the Uwa indigenous people. And he wanted to talk to me about oil because uh, British Petroleum and Occidental were drilling under their land. The role of the Uwa spiritual advisors is to mediate between the earth and the tribe. And they had felt in their 5,000 year recorded, verbally recorded history, uh, or I don't know how many thousands of years verbally recorded history, that they, um, that they had to leave the land the way they found it. And he said to me this phrase, for us, oil is the blood of the earth. And if you disturb too much the blood of the earth, in our spiritual beliefs, terrible things will happen. It will get hot, it will get cold, there will be floods, um, there will be droughts. And he proceeded to explain how the world would change if you disturb the blood of the earth too much. He then said to me, we wonder if you could help us, Professor Carl, because I, the 200 religious leaders of the indigenous tribe of the Uwa, all male, have taken a vow that if we cannot protect our territory and we cannot protect the blood of the earth, that we are going to commit collective suicide. Well, that's uh, something to happen in your office hours, let me tell you. This was an absolutely serious comment, by the way. Um, it resulted in a long legal battle that now has um, all oil companies on hold, not actually exploring in the indigenous territory of the Uwa. But I tell you that because in places where oil actually exists, um, and in places that become dependent on oil, the picture is not as pretty as, um, as a lot of statistics showing how much energy there is uh, says to us. And what I believe very strongly is that if we do not have a global solution that is fair between consumers and producers, we will not only have the environmental problems that have been heard about so much, but we will have consistent and persistent war
that I also believe will blow back on us in the United States. And let me tell you why I say that. I have not a lot of time, so I'm going to say this very quickly. Um, the first thing about oil, for those of you who have ever studied it, is that if you are dependent on oil, can I have the first slide, please? Um, keep going. If you're dependent on oil, as these countries are, um, meaning it is what you primarily live from in your fiscal health, um, then the thing that you experience as a country are very disappointing development outcomes over time. And I'm not now talking about the United States or producing countries. I'm talking about countries that live from the export of oil. Next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to give you a feel of this. What is called the resource curse, in my view, is just an inverse relationship uh, between natural resource or oil uh, abundance, and particularly oil, and growth. And if you keep going on that, uh, keep going. And next slide, please. Don't have enough time to do all this the way I'd like to, but let me just show you this slide. This is a spectacular slide. If you realize that in the 70s, at the beginning of the 70s, the oil exporting countries as a group received the most massive transfer of wealth ever to occur in history without war towards them. The most massive transfer of wealth. When I was living in Venezuela, Venezuela got more in two years in the 1973-4 oil boom than it had in all previous recorded budgets in its history. Now just think of that. And yet, what are the outcomes from something like that? And this is not just Venezuela's outcome. These are uh, the OPEC countries as a group. They just don't do very well. And that's what we call the resource curse. Next slide, please. Um, this is another way of showing it. Uh, the red is average world growth, average LDC growth, and you can see that with the exception of Iran and Norway, and Iran is primarily, by the way, a demographic phenomena, um, growth rates look very bad. Can you keep going? One of the reasons for that is a terms of, classic terms of trade argument, which is if you live off of one commodity, you have to buy everything else. And what you see is that over time, most other commodities end up being more expensive than oil as a group. And so that gives you a little bit of a sense of why rich oil countries are in fact poor in many ways. Next slide, please. Um, could you hit that again? I wanted you to see where most oil comes from, the countries that, most, uh, that are the greatest producers of oil and the top ones are the greatest exporters. And what's important about those regimes is that we've had a big debate in political science about whether those regimes are democratic or not democratic, stable or not stable. Two different questions. How durable and stable are they? How democratic are they? Could, next slide, please. Now, here's what I think in this debate. Um, I think there's a paradox. I once called it a paradox of plenty, in which I meant that oil-rich countries have such poor development outcomes. But there's another paradox, and that is most oil regimes, whether they're authoritarian or democratic, last a very long time. On the other hand, oils, countries that are dependent on oil as a group are the most likely countries. They have a much greater, higher propensity to have civil war. So they're both stable and with greater prospects of descending into war as a group again. Next slide, please. Oil is associated with authoritarian rule, but that's largely because most of the places that were dependent on oil were already authoritarian as oil rents become a very important part of their budget. Uh, it does not mean that oil countries cannot be democratic. That is not the argument. It just is catching a historic relationship that most of the places that you found oil were already authoritarian, and that oil rents when they come on stream, will keep any government in power over time as long as they're incrementally growing. And I want to say something about that because I think this is a really important point about how oil rents, by that I mean the excess profits from oil, sustain governments in power. And there's a big, again, big debate in political science. Do they sustain democracies? Do they sustain authoritarian regi regimes? Are the mechanisms the same? Are the mechanisms different? I don't think it's that complicated. 
Let's pretend for a moment that I am the leader of an oil exporting country and you all are my citizens or subjects or whatever. How am I going to govern? I'm going to try to extract as much as I can from the international oil sector and I am going to distribute that oil in a way to keep me in power. That's what I'm going to do. Now, if, if I'm a Sunni and you all are Sunnis, you're going to get more. Um, if you're Kurds over there and you happen to be sitting on top of the oil but I want your oil, I'm going to repress you more. There's a logic of distribution of oil and that logic has to do with the political survival of regimes. So when you figure out who you think your support base is, whether it's a social class, whether it's an indigenous group, whether it's a linguistic group, whether it's a religious group, whatever, that's part of the way you distribute your oil rents. And that's one of the reasons why the outcomes, the economic outcomes aren't very good because one of the things we know is if you distribute oil rents on a political basis in order to keep a particular government in power, you're not necessarily thinking about efficiency, sustainability, or long-term economic development. You're really thinking about how can I stay here, which is a different way of thinking. And that means that um, in this process, that oil states are really different than other states. They're what I like to call honeypots. The way you get into an oil state, the way you collect money, the way you get money is you link up to it in some way. <laughs> and that way may be a political party, it may be that you're in the Ba'athist party of Saddam Hussein, it may be under the previous uh, government in Venezuela, the two-party system, one out of every seven Venezuelans belong to both parties. And the reason they belong to both parties is it allowed you to get a job or some access or something um, from the government itself. That's something you wouldn't see in most other countries. Now, why is it so different? The reason it's different is that most states live off of taxes. I extract revenues from you, I give you back something, a school, a, you know, military protection or whatever. And you, in turn, since I'm taking your money, say to me, I want some say in how I'm, my money's being spent. That's what we call taxation with representation. That's the, the link that is broken in oil exporting countries. And with very few exceptions, and one of them is the Chavez government today, there's very little effort to reforge that link and build a tax system that is independent in some way from petroleum. So the minute you live off of rents, you break the bond between you, the ruler, uh, me, the ruler, and you, the citizens, in a sense. And, and so you feel like whatever I'm spending doesn't really belong to you. It's not yours. And you also don't hold me accountable for whatever ways it's being spent. Um, next slide, please. Now, what does that mean? When nobody's scrutinizing you, when there's a lot of money going around, when states are uh, not institutionally strong, it's a formula not only for poor spending and for poor patterns of spending, which characterize all kinds of oil exporters, um, but also for corruption. Money leaks out all over the place. And what you see is that since there's so much money floating around, the levels of corruption, by and large, in oil exporters, and not all of them, uh, is higher. Next slide, please. The other thing you see is that a piece of that, actually corruption in some senses, is actually borrowing. Because there was a logic in the 70s for borrowing for oil exporters. Oil exporters became the biggest borrowers in the 70s during the middle of the most massive transfer of wealth towards them. Well, why? The logic was, Interest rates were low, oil prices were high, leave the oil in the ground, let it keep appreciating, and borrow cheap money, right? Well, what happened? Interest rates went up, oil prices went down. And so all of those countries that did that were stuck. Now, the other problem came, and again, I'm going to use Venezuela as an example as a country I know best, but this is actually is in a number of other oil exporters. In the, in many oil exporters, including the 
previous regime in Venezuela, the way you could borrow money without any controls is you could use short-term debt. If you used long-term debt, you used to have to go through the parliament and you know, ministers and all kinds of other people. But short-term debt, every state enterprise could borrow without even asking anybody. So that means they accrue debt that's much more expensive, much worse for the country, at a much greater rate than anyone else. Next slide, please. Now, what does all this turn out to? It turns to quality of life indicators that are pretty shocking. Because here you are, a rich oil country, only you're not. <laughs> only that's not what people experience. And I think um, I want to give you some contemporary uh, polling data from Venezuela. And uh, by the way, I can re uh, replicate this in every country I can find polling data in. I just happen to have this with me. When you have these results, after years and years of oil spending, you have what we call a social debt. And by that I mean people believe they should have more than they do. Contemporary Venezuelan polling, this is actually from 2000, it's not so contemporary, it's from 2003. 90% of Venezuelans believe their country is one of the richest on earth. 75% say they are poor. A huge 50% in 2003 said there was no way to overcome their poverty. Venezuelans then say, when asked to explain this, that this is because their oil money has been stolen by the rich, the politicians, and the foreigners. That's the perception of why they believe they live like they do in 2003. And that's what we call a social debt. Next slide, please. Now, what does this mean? This is my link to conflict here. If I'm spending all this money to keep myself in power by doing some combination of co-optation and, and repression, at the same time, what is accumulating underneath me <laughs> and many other regimes are a series of grievances. Now, I'm not going to have time to go through these grievances and how I've been documenting them, but what I'd like to do is explain that, first of all, they start at the point where production of petroleum actually occurs. Next slide, please. They start with exploration impacts, particularly where indigenous people are and where very fragile environments are, which is where oil companies are working more and more now. Um, next slide. They continue through tremendous, the tremendous impact of production, through environmental and social problems that are linked to transport. Could I have the next slide, please? Next slide, please. And this is what you get. This is a picture of Ogoni land in Nigeria. Now, if you go to, Nago if you go to Ogoni land in Nigeria, you will see a group called MEND. And this is their platform. This is what they stand for. And I'm quoting, the total destruction of the capacity of the Nigerian state to export petroleum. In other words, they have gone from a sense of let's just capture some of the rents and get some of ours and go to you destroyed us, now we're going to destroy you. That's the logic that is going on in the Niger Delta today. It couldn't be any worse. Now, I say this because, next slide, please. There's a link between these kinds, next slide, um, these kinds of grievances. Go ahead, one more. Uh, there, good. Um, these kinds of grievances and the development of civil wars. In, inside oil exporting countries. And the thing, the reason I was feeling a bit of a disconnect in the discussions that were going on about oil is, and I think David made this point and other, Vito made this point and others, is that unless you realize that the production of petroleum could very well end up in civil wars which then take production off the market, um, that means that we're actually facing a problem that markets can't solve, and that is not just the climate problem, but the issue of global security, the issue of global welfare, the issue of how people live inside oil exporting countries themselves, the tremendous incentive for wars, particularly 
in places where oil is located and for secessionist wars in places like Aceh in Indonesia or Cabinda in Angola or uh, the Kurds or Kurdistan in Iraq, et cetera, et cetera. That this is a very real problem and the Iraq story that we're seeing, we will see repeated, I very much believe, unless there is a more cooperative way of distributing the costs and benefits of how uh, we produce energy in this world and how we use it. And I want to end um, just by saying, uh, sharing one statistic with you, and then I will stop. And that is, find it. Um, today, at least 34 less developed countries rely on oil and natural gas for at least 30% of their export revenues. One third of these countries have per capita incomes of less than $1,500 a year. These people then are oil rich, but their populations are dirt poor. And almost all of this latter group and some of the former are potential or actual failing states. So I would leave you with this thought. I believe that unless we urgently change the current injustices in, way the in, way in the ways in which the benefits of oil are distributed, if we don't alter our own consumption patterns and search for less damaging energy alternatives, these state failures will consistently blow back on us and they will fuel more and more conflict in the future, weakening the prospects for democracy and the prospects for development. Thank you. I want to begin by thanking Chris Milroy and Jeffrey Crane for putting together such an interesting and rich conference. Um, I have been learning a tremendous amount over the past uh, day and a half, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. So thank you very much. Um, I want to begin by saying that um, I began my academic career um, focusing on water and conflict in the Middle East and North Africa. And I came to that topic because I was very passionate about the Israeli-Palestinian relationship. And I knew that um, inequitable distribution of water was an important element of that relationship. And I spent um, many years reading and writing and talking about water and conflict in the Middle East. and. Um, in the mid-90s, when I was beginning to feel that I had said just about all that I wanted to say about the topic, a former uh, professor of mine came over to me and he said, you know, Miriam, you know so much about uh, water issues. Uh, why don't you write a, a paper uh, investigating whether water would be to the 21st century, what oil was to the 20th century? And I said, well, you know, I don't know anything about oil. so." Um, I started reading about oil exporting states and since um, I had been nurtured on the documentary film The Battle of Algiers, I thought I would start uh, with Algeria and I did and I became very passionate about Algeria and I thought that this country had had such a very, very interesting developmental trajectory that I wanted to explore. And um, somewhere along the way, I was reminded of my graduate school uh, readings on the Rantier State, uh, where there was this implicit, not even implicit, but explicit suggestion that oil determines outcomes. And I was very concerned about this because um, oil was discovered in Algeria just a few years prior to independence, yet I was convinced that the political trajectory of Algeria was um, deeply conditioned by the history of Algerian nationalism that preceded the discovery of oil. And so um, this was the beginning of what has become, um, for me, a kind of a criticism of what I have perceived in the so-called resource curse literature as a kind of commodity determinism. I am 
convinced that it's not the resource itself that does anything, but rather what leaders do with that resource and how leaders manage the challenges that those resources present. And so my focus is on leadership. And I think that those of us who want to make sense of what happens in these oil exporting states is not to focus on the ills of oil or the, you know, th th that oil is the devil's excrement, but rather to hone in on the challenges to leadership. And, um, and, and, and that's really at the core of what I want to say today. Um, uh, I think that much of the literature that has been uh, written in recent years on the Rancher State and the resource curse assigns far too much weight to economic structure and to oil rents in, to, in particular and insufficient weight to such things as historical legacies, the choices of leaders, and even cultural peculiarities. I should point out to you that many of the oil exporting states today are post-colonial states, and we must remember what the colonial experience left with our newly independent states. The implied suggestion of much of this literature is that oil exporting states evolve as they do because of oil and not because of such things as bad government or inappropriate policies or something altogether unrelated to oil. And I would like to suggest that the absence of democracy, the persistence of authoritarianism, the, uh, uh, the prevalence of civil war, may not be related to oil, it may be related to other uh, uh, historical factors uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, have a strong bearing on uh, political stability and instability. The other thing is, and, and so there is this tendency to uh, suggest that oil revenues spawn a particular set of effects, but we need to prove that those effects actually did issue from oil and neither preceded oil nor issued from something else. Um, a, a very recent critique of the literature notes that raunchy states tend to be located in regions where states, raunchy or not, typically suffer from generally unsatisfactory political outcomes. So I want to uh, keep that in mind as we, um, as we uh, focus on oil as, um, as a, uh, uh, a problem. Um, the other thing is that if you do not factor agency or cultural peculiarities or historical legacies more systematically in, into your analyses, Studies of the resource curse cannot account for some of the very interesting variations among oil exporters in terms of both strategies and performance, nor can they uh, provide compelling explanations for uh, political outcomes. Now, it is true that in um, more recent years, we're getting, uh, 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 I would say, uh, richer uh, analyses where there's an effort to look at, for example, the impact of pre-existing institutions on political outcomes. And um, this is a, a trend that I, sh I think uh, should, be, um, should be encouraged. Um, the more recent statistical analyses um, of um, oil and oil exporting states that look at the relationship between natural resource wealth and civil war or the absence of democracy or the persistence of authoritarianism or uh, regime durability um, do in many cases indicate statistically robust uh, relationships. However, um, I fear that depending on the data set that you use, you may get different kinds of uh, results. And, um, and that is a concern of mine. The other concern of mine 
is that the causal mechanisms linking um, uh, uh, th these variables have to be more clearly um, um, uh, uh, um, um, uh, worked through, and I haven't seen enough convincing analysis of these causal relationships. And I could tell you some um, analyses that I have seen that actually defy historical evidence um, uh, in the Middle East uh, and North Africa, which is one area of the world that I uh, do have some familiarity with. The implicit suggestion of much of the literature that oil promotes instability is beginning to be uh, contested. Um, in 2003, for the first time, there was a quantitative study that did demonstrate that oil exporting states are not particularly prone to instability and failure. And this was despite the suggestions of both the Rontier state literature and more recent scholarship on civil war. In a study that I conducted on uh, violence in Algeria for the World Bank a couple of years ago, I found only an indirect link between oil wealth and the civil war in Algeria. Um, and there are, as I said, a few of us who are part of a new trend in the resource curse literature that are trying to locate explanations for outcomes uh, in oil exporting states, uh, more squarely within the framework of the modern nation state and institutional foundations that inhere in the modern state. Um, and so, for example, there is one study uh, that has just come out where uh, political outcomes depend on the timing of access to oil rents relative to uh, industrial development. Um, what I want to do in my remaining time is uh, look at um, oil and instability and um, look at three cases and um, three cases and three different outcomes uh, to give you a sense of how regimes, when faced with an exogenous economic shock, when uh, prices fall dramatically, oil prices dramatically fall, how oil exporting, how different oil exporting states have responded differently to that challenge with different outcomes. And um, those three countries are Iran, Algeria, and Saudi Arabia. The three different outcomes are regime breakdown and change in Iran, regime stability and persistence in Saudi Arabia, regime crisis and restabilization in Algeria. And I'm going to look at two oil price downturns. The first, the late 1970s, as it affected Iran and Algeria, and the second, the late 1980s, as it affected Algeria and Saudi Arabia. Um, in in um, 1973, uh, when there was the first oil boom, uh, the Shah of Iran uh, completely ignored his policy community and decided on his own to multiply investment targets with no attention to the country's absorptive capacity. And the huge distortions that ensued caused the economy to spin out of control. At the same time, the newfound wealth fed the Shah's autocratic political ambitions, and he disbanded the two political parties that existed at the time and replaced them with his own creation, the Rastakhis party that became his own personal mouthpiece, and he transformed Iran into a weakly institutionalized totalitarian style single party state with, by the mid-1970s, little other than repressive capacity. And so far, this sounds just like the raunchy, what the raunchy state literature um, would tell us. But then when very high inflation, accompanied by recession, followed soon after the oil boom, the Shah re refused to find ways to address the economic hardship that much of his population faced. He did instruct ministries to cut back on spending, 
but corruption re remained widespread and mounting, and private Iranian investors were sending huge sums of money abroad on a daily basis. The Shah's principal effort at this time was to lash out at those social forces he detested and that posed in his view a challenge to his domination of the domestic political economy. He targeted the Bazari merchants and ignored, he imposed debilitating regulations on them and ignored the, the activities of the big industrialists and the large importers. And in that way, he kind of tantalized and radicalized an opposition rather than pacifying it. In Algeria, the recession years of the, uh, of the late 1970s were also difficult times, but in contrast to the Shah, Houari Boumedien, the president of Algeria, uh, was able to manage the growing dissent fairly effectively. And he did so by investing in institutions in ways that alter distribution. He understood that his development strategy was causing a tremendous hardship. And so what he did was he opened up some political space uh, for um, uh, po the population to express themselves. He called for a national debate. And he figured that the impression of some degree of po uh, political participation at a time of economic hardship would, um, would reinvigorate support for the regime and ease domestic suffering. And in fact, he was fairly successful in this regard. He did implement some structural reforms at this time. He gave some sense of the people having some um, uh, voice in the system and the results in terms of domestic peace at this particular juncture were uh, positive. The Shah's methods were uh, uh, woefully inadequate and uh, his uh, preferred strategy was through repression. After having targeted the Bazaris, he went after the clergy and um, he, uh, when they went out into the streets, uh, he had his military uh, fire on the, the crowds and they did so repeatedly. Um, when he eventually tried to engage with um, the opposition, he chose those members of the opposition who were not even allied with Khomeini, who was the leader of the opposition. So it shows you how alienated he was from social preferences. And uh, eventually, uh, with only a willingness to use force, the monarchy uh, crumbled. Um, the, <clears throat> the 1986 oil shock was even more challenging uh, for the political stability of oil exporting states. As you know, oil prices plummeted to $10 a barrel from $40 a barrel uh, just a few years before. Within a few years of uh, that oil shock, Algeria was highly destabilized. In the early 1990s, it was in the throes of a civil war that would last roughly 10 years, and the regime appeared for some time to be on the verge of collapse. In contrast, Saudi Arabia mastered that, uh, weathered the 1986 shock masterfully, it seemed. Um, what happened in 1986 for Algeria? Well, first of all, the, in response to the growing dissent as a, as a result of the oil shock, uh, the uh, new president, Shadli Ben Jadid, uh, decided to uh, uh, embark upon a democratic t transition. But then a few years later, in 1991, when it became clear that an Islamist party was going to win power and the FLN, the single party state that had, the single party that had dominated since independence in 62 was going to lose, the military, which was the strongest institution in the country, intervened and put a stop to the electoral process and the democratic transition with force. And the military-backed regime pursued the Islamist opposition with utmost brutality for several years, with the result that insurgency grew and developed and factionalized and radicalized. Um, but it, Algeria, the Algerian regime learned after a while that severe repression on its own was an ineffective, in fact, a counterproductive strategy. 
And what the Algerian regime began to do as of the mid-1990s was it began to appropriate the political agendas of the opposition for its own. It um, co-opted uh, the Islamists by encouraging an of official Islamist opposition, and it co-opted, oh my God, the, um, the uh, Berberists by, um, by uh, organizing, by, by quarantining the uh, uh, Berber opposition. And um, uh, this worked very well for the regime for some time, Fortunately, by the end of the 1990s, when oil prices increased, the government had uh, more money where it could use, um, um, it could use money to, to consolidate its co-optation strategies. It also, fortunately, very, fortunately for itself, had the uh, war on terror that it allied itself to claiming to the U.S. government that it had tremendous experience in um, combating Islamic terror and so uh, won a lot of uh, uh, stature in the international community. So through a combination of targeted violence, co-optation, and manipulation of key forces, the Algerian regime was able to restabilize after a period of tremendous instability. If you would just allow me to say a few words about the Saudi monarchy, because the Saudis have been uh, uh, brilliant, I think, in ensuring their own uh, uh, um, durability. And that is that during bust periods, they did not remove subsidies for their population. They understood that they needed to keep their population happy. So in 1986, they slashed all their development projects. And by the way, uh, you know, their economy, uh, uh, per capita income just plummeted unbelievably at that time. People think that Saudi Arabia has enormous sums of money, so it couldn't have been hurt that badly. It was hurt enormously. But the regime would not remove subsidies uh, uh, on the population, and it, in fact, it increased welfare services at the time. During the Gulf War, when the Saudi population was furious that there were foreign uh, 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 um, uh, military on, on its soil from which they were, uh, from which there were attacks on Iraq, uh, what the Saudi government did was encourage the population to speak up. It accepted petitions from the population to express their concerns and their grievances. And slowly but surely, that regime has been prepared to give, in, to give piecemeal uh, uh, political reforms that don't impact it too much, but keep the mo more moderate forces happy. I'm racing through this, um, but I think what I'm trying to say, show here is that there is a variation in responses to uh, oil shocks and the, very, the, the different ways in which regimes respond to oil shocks determine the kinds of outcomes that one finds in those countries in terms of stability or instability. And thank you. It's my great pleasure to come back to Chicago. And uh, I remember like seven years ago, when I first came to Chicago, I took the uh, price theory class from, uh, from uh, Professor Kevin Murphy. And he told me that uh, numbers are important. So since I'm the only economist in this panel, I'm gonna uh, show you more numbers, okay? So this is what I'm planning to do. Um, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is a scale plot, okay? So on the x-axis, we have oil reserve. As in 2004, and on the y-axis, a vertical axis, we have a measure of a democracy, okay? And uh, zero means it's very non-democratic, and one is the most democratic. So we can see that the United States is on the top. It's the mo one of the most democratic countries in the world. And you look at Saudi Arabia, they have a lot of oil, and uh, they're one of the least democratic countries in the world. So the question here is that, I mean, a clear, there's a clear negative relationship between democracy and uh, oil reserve. The question here is uh, how we want to measure oil, oil okay? So um, our previous speaker, they, they, they used to measure that um, oil dependency, okay? 
and 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 the literature that create a lot of uh, debate on whether that's the right measure of uh, of oil wealth. Because if the story is about oil wealth, then why it matters you sell oil to to the people in your country or people in the other countries? If if the pro is the if this is the oil profit that helps the leaders to stay in power, then the relevant uh, variable that we should be looking at is the oil profit, right? So here I'm I'm using the oil reserve, and uh, and uh, I'm going to argue that this is the relevant thing we should be looking at. And um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so as an economist, we don't we're not really good at uh, knowing studying a lot of uh, uh, political institutional details, but we are. Uh, good at uh, some fundamental concepts, okay, like uh, cost, okay, if we think about oil profit as the, as the evil, then uh, profit is a difference between revenue and cost. So uh, we better have some, some measure of get, get a handle of, uh, of the cost of production. So this is what, we, what I'm going to talk about today. And then the next thing is, uh, is wealth, okay, that's what I learned uh, in Chicago as well. Um, it's not just the income that you have today, but also the money that you expect to earn in the future. Okay, so and that's why if we think about um, export, which is a flow variable, uh, uh, that's going to tell you how much oil money you're going to make this year, but it's not going to tell you anything about how much oil money you're going to make in the future. Right. So the relevant concept is going to be a discount value of the oil income that a leader is expected to get. Okay, so this is going to be important in, in, in my presentation as well. And then in terms of the underlying story that I want to tell at the very end of this presentation, I want to tell you a, a story and watch uh, why uh, it matters, why we expect to find a, a negative relationship between oil wealth and democracy. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you a very simple story about how that's going to affect the leaders' incentive to stay in power, and then that's going to be a supply and demand of freedom or democracy, if you will, and uh, and uh, how competition uh, for leadership is going to uh, be important. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So um, this is the data I get from those uh, peak oil people. Okay, and those uh, there's a organization called uh, Association Study of Peak Oil. Uh, it's, an, it's a non-profit organization. Uh, uh, members in that organization are a group of uh, oil experts. Okay? So they collect data. They have industrial data to understand the uh, problem of peak oil. Okay? And they claim that uh, they have the reliable data. Okay, and the, and, the, and the reason why they argue the public data that we have seen in some other presentation and in, in, in this uh, conference, uh, which are based, uh, basically based on the uh, data from BP. Okay, and those oil experts, they argue that the data from BP, they are very bad. Okay, and the reason is because nowadays a lot of those uh, oil producing countries, they're, they have their, uh, it's basically self-report data. They can report whatever they want, okay? And in particular, since uh, the OPEC quota system, if you look at the uh, BP data, in a few years, they just double their reserve, okay? And the reason is because basically um, their quota, how much each OPEC country can produce, is based on their reported reserve. So there's a lot of noise in terms of, uh, in terms of the reporting data. So I got the data from them, and they, those people, they told me that each country, um, they have a one peak discovery year. For example, for the US, okay, uh, we have a lot of oil in this country. A lot of people didn't know that. I mean, in terms of endowment, the total amount of discover, it's comparable to Saudi Arabia. It's just somehow that uh, we discover oil, uh, the peak discovery year is, is on the 1930s, okay? And Saudi Arabia, they started later. Okay, their peak discovery year is in the uh, 50s. Okay, so by looking at these data, uh, it tells you that the distribution of the size, one thing is the size, the other is the timing of discovery. Okay, so in the following analysis, I'm going to use this kind of data to make a comparison that, okay, if a particular country, they discover oil in a particular year, then I want to see whether before and after whether the country is becoming more or less democratic, okay? Because a lot of debate um, 
And this uh, resource curse literature is that, well, when you look at the oil dependence, well, then when we measure the oil dependence, then it's basically two, prob two problems created by, by, by looking at the oil uh, dependence. The first thing is export. Okay, export is what? It's production and then a net of the domestic consumption. Then people can argue that, some economists argue that, well, if there's some underlying reason, um, maybe cultural or, or, or some other reason that we don't observe, okay, uh, that's going to uh, hinder the economic development of a country, okay? That's going to lead to low consumption domestically, and that's why they're going to export more. Okay, that's one reason. And then another reason is that when people look at that oil, depend, uh, oil dependence measure, export, and then normalize that divided by the uh, uh, income of the country, then they create another problem. That another problem is, again, if there's some other reason that um, researcher cannot observe that why uh, the country is not doing well, then that's going to reflect in the income, right? And that's going to inflate the oil dependency. And, and if we want to understand the relationship between oil, uh, oil wealth and economic growth, then that's something that's going to be created artificially uh, that there's a negative correlation between um, oil dependence and, and, and economic growth. And that's why uh, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, we should measure oil in terms of the oil endowment, okay, and see whether that, that really creates a problem, okay. Um, next slide, please. Another measurement issue I want to talk about is the heterogeneity, heterogeneity in terms of oil production cost. Okay? There's a huge heterogeneity. Okay? And we think about profit as a difference between in, uh, revenue and cost, then this is something we cannot ignore. When we think about production or export as just a gross revenue, Okay, but if it costs a lot to produce, then it doesn't mean that the leader is going to get a lot of oil money. So we look at this this uh, um, diagram uh, from the data sources from IEA, and then there's a lot of I mean heterogeneity in terms of the cost of production and in terms of oil. So those uh, cheap oil which has has already been produced, they're relatively cheap to produce. In terms of the cost, is between a few bucks to 20, 20 bucks per barrel. And then if we look at those uh, Middle East OPEC countries, I mean, these are the countries in which they have relatively cheap oil, okay? And then there are other conventional oil. Uh, the cost can, can be ranged from 10 bucks to, to 40, uh, 50 bucks, okay? So there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of the cost of production. And if oil profit provide incentive for the leader to stay in power, then we have to somehow capture that. Slide, please. Oh, this is a uh, <clears throat> this is one beautiful picture that I got from a, ge a geologist. He told me that this is how a particular oil field, uh, the pr lifetime profile, production profile of uh, any particular oil field. So, and that's going to be important. But let me first tell you uh, roughly what this graph is about. So, this is the y-axis we have the time, and then the uh, the x-axis we have the time. The y-axis we have the oil production rate. Okay, so initially, uh, oil is discovered, and then it takes usually about five to ten years to develop. Okay, and then they can start producing. Okay, and then initially, let's build up the, 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 the capacity, and then after a little while, depends on the size of the oil field, and then it's got flat. And then after that, decline. Okay, and the important message from this picture, a few things. First, um, we can have, depends on when oil is discovered, okay? Two oil countries can produce the same amount of oil, and hence they may export the same amount of oil. But in terms of the oil wealth, because oil wealth is how much you can make in the future, we have to somehow capitalize the future income as well. So because of this U-shape, I mean, an inward U-shaped thing, two oil producing countries, if they discover oil in a different period of time, then they can produce the same amount of oil at a particular point in time, but in terms of their wealth implication can be different. Right? If you just discover the oil, then there's going to be a lot of wealth down the road. But if it's declining, then that's going to be very different. Okay? Uh, another thing that I want to talk about is this profile not only tells you the oil production profile, but also in terms of the cost. Okay? And naturally, the cost of production is relatively cheap because oil just come out from the ground from natural uh, uh, pressure. 
But then over time, then you have to inject uh, water initially, and then you have to inject gas and so on, and they're very expensive. So, and that's going to exacerbate the uh, change in the oil. Okay. Well. So there are a bunch of democratic countries. Okay, they are they have been democratic before they discover oil. Okay, and those country, and then the one with the black dot are the oil country. So they are, they, ha they are democratic country, and they had oil. They discover oil. So those countries are like the United States and Norway, UK, okay? So they have been democratic before they discover oil. And they remain democratic, okay? And there are other, there, the, and then we can compare that with the, uh, another, the uh, bubble uh, white dot on the top as well. So they are oil, democratic country as well, but they don't have, no, they don't have a lot of oil. And, and we can see that it doesn't matter. For countries in which they, have been democratic before they, they, they found the oil, they remain democratic, okay? And, uh, but then when we look at the bottom of this diagram, then we have a similar uh, 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 two time series. One is, I mean, down there, they're all de non-democratic countries. So these countries, they have been non-democratic before they discovered oil. And some, they're lucky to discover oil, and some, they didn't. And we observe there's a divergence between the degree of democracy. So those countries who were lucky enough to have oil, they remain non-democratic. And over time, uh, those who didn't discover oil, they're getting more and more democratic. So there's a divergence between the degree of democracy, okay, when we, try, when we measure uh, oil in terms of the oil endowment. Okay, and roughly speaking, if we look at this diagram, after three decades of the oil discovery, then the gap, okay, the, the oil, people, some people use the term uh, freedom deficit. Uh, the difference between uh, an oil country and non-oil non, non countries is about uh, 0 0.15 percentage point in terms of the degree of democracy. Uh, next slide, please. And then, uh, we can do some fancy regression analysis, and then it tells you that there's no effect, or discovery has no effect for democratic countries. It's not going to make Norway, U.S. less democratic. But for non-democratic countries, a discovery of, uh, when we convert that into the dollar terms, uh, $280 billion worth of oil revenue is going to push down or reduce the democracy by about 30 percentage points. And what does that 30 percentage point mean? Uh, roughly speaking, 30 percentage, percentage point of democracy is something like the difference between uh, Jordan and Saudi Arabia. So Jordan, they don't have a lot of oil, and then Saudi Arabia have a lot of oil. And the difference in terms of the degree of democracy is about uh, 30 percentage point. Okay? And then um, the next finding is that, uh, in term, what about in terms of the cost? So uh, in terms of the cost of uh, production, a reduction in about 100 billion of uh, exploration costs is going to reduce democracy by about 15 percentage point. So they are, in a way, in terms of the order of they're, they're in the bo same ballpark. So the revenue and the, and the cost is going to affect uh, uh, the uh, change in democracy in, in pretty much the same way. Okay? And finally, uh, when we look at uh, the uh, heterogeneity in terms of the quality and the cost of production, then uh, I found that uh, the, the anti-democratic uh, effect of oil increases in oil quality. So some countries like Algeria, their quality of oil is, pretty, is very good. So they have very low sulfur content and it's also very light. So these countries, uh, the anti-democratic effect is bigger. And also, on the other hand, it's decreases in the cost of production, so, uh, which is consistent with the story about, about the uh, profitability of, 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 uh, of uh, oil wealth. Okay, uh, next slide, please. And then, uh, and then we can look at uh, several uh, case studies. So this is like, the first story is about like the oil discovery. It's like the rise of the oil wealth. And then what about if we look at uh, the decline of oil wealth? So here I look at some uh, um, uh, Gulf states, okay? There are three Gulf states in which uh, in particular, I mean, the, basically the case I want to look at is Bahrain, okay? So I'll rank these three countries. They have similar um, cultural and geographical background. Uh, also in terms of population, Bahrain and Qatar, they're very similar. And they're, they're just next to each other, okay? And I rank these countries according to the oil endowment. So we can see the Bahrain, um, they discover 1.21 
gigabarrels of oil. And then if we look at Omer and, 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 and Qatar, they have way almost like 10 times more oil, okay? But uh, the difference between Oman and Qatar is that somehow Qatar, they, they have more, uh, the, in terms of cost of production, their, their, their cost of production is lower than Omer. Because we look at, they have more giant oil fields. So the oil fields are in general bigger. And, uh, and also um, the quality of oil, we can look at that uh, uh, from Qatar is also, big, uh, is also better. And then we, if we rank according to their oil wealth, and then we look at their, their quality index, which is the, the measure of democracy. So we can see that Bahrain is more democratic than Oman, and Oman is more democratic than Qatar. And this is the level. If we look at the transition since 1991, we find the same pattern. So they start off with uh, all equally non-democratic, but over time, Bahrain is getting more and more democratic. I mean, still not very democratic uh, uh, according to the, our standard, but still, Amount those Gulf country, they're one of the most democratic ones. Uh, next slide, please. And here, another similar case study in which I look at the, uh, those post-communist producers, okay? Uh, I exclude Russia in this, in, in, in this, uh, in this uh, table because uh, there's a lot of debate in terms of how democratic Russia is. And uh, so I look at others uh, post-communist or producing country. And again, I rank them according to the oil endowment from the Albania to uh, Kazakhstan. And again, it's consistent with the story that um, uh, oil, I mean, those countries who are, uh, have production declining, they tend to be more, getting more and more democratic over time. And, and Kazakhstan, in fact, is getting less and less democratic. So, which is consistent with my oil story. Next slide, please. And we can look at another scale plot, just look at by region, oil reserve and democracy. This is Middle East, negatively related. Next slide, please. But what about in terms of, so we try to understand what's going on. So what I did here is I look at the oil reserve, but instead of looking at their uh, degree of democracy, I look at their military expenditure as a fraction of GDP. So I want to understand whether an oil country, they spend more on, 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 on defense or military spending. And it turns out to be true. And I'm going to tell you a story why that's the case. Next slide, please. That's true for those Euro-Asia country, negative relationship between democracy and oil reserve. Next slide, please. And a positive relationship between oil reserve and military spending. Next slide, please. So this is a conclusion. And basically the story is that, just think about an oil producer and an oil leader. There's a lot of money that uh, provide them an incentive to stay in power. And to stay in power, they have to spend more resource to make sure that they, stay, they, they are remaining in power. So they spend more uh, in, in military spending. It's like a form of barriers to entry to ensure that they can stay in power, so that they kill their enemy and so on. And uh, so we can think about supply and demand of democracy, and oil wealth is going to, inc to lower to reduce the supply of freedom, or to increase the supply of repression. So, uh, and and uh, yeah, that's the end of the talk. Time's up. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all three of our panelists for very uh, interesting and stimulating presentations. And uh, I, I, on a personal level, learned a lot. I think it's often difficult to attempt to reduce decisions that occur in any one country down to a single variable. But clearly, at a, at a larger, more macro level, there are patterns going on. And uh, there did seem to be some difference uh, of opinion regarding the degree to which there is a causal link between uh, energy resource uh, and uh, varying degrees of, of, of uh, democratic institutions. And I thought it might be good to start off by just having each of our panelists or see if, if, if the three of you have any comments you want to make on the presentations, and then we'll turn it over to the to the group, or if you don't have any comments on each other's presentations, we can start off. I think we can Sounds. start off. I don't have. Do you have any comments? No? Nope. Well, that's very straightforward. <laughs> okay. Um, that's a good line. Let me then begin by asking the first question. Um, <laughs> in many ways, the, the portrait that's painted is a very sobering one. Uh, there's clearly something going on which 
uh, should be of concern to all. And the question is, what do we do about it? Now, obviously, uh, decreasing our dependence on oil is an option. But barring that, what are the options available to this nation and to the international community to help facilitate the development of democratic institutions and re reduce conflicts in these countries? How do we engage other nations in that process? Uh, is, is it possible to develop a framework that brings in China and other emerging countries that clearly have a, a geostrategic stake in this? Uh, do any of the three of you have opinions on uh, that? Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to be able to elaborate on this, but there's a, actually a new book that came out this week um, that is edited by uh, Jeffrey Sachs and, and um, Joe Stieglitz and McCartan Humphreys called Escaping the Resource Curse. And I'm going to try to summarize really fast my chapter there. <laughs> the first thing I would say that you do is you don't start a war in an oil exporting country. Number one, <laughs> you just don't do that. There are a lot of reasons why you don't do that. But the second thing, the, the main reason is that what is really important in my view inside oil exporters, and I'm going to get outside in a minute, but inside oil exporters is whatever their regime type, whatever they're like, um, is to foster a wider and wider debate and consciousness about oil being their resource and their future <laughs> in this end and reconnecting back uh, the sense of oil wealth in the way that other people feel relation uh, with their tax dollars, if I can put it mm. that way. The reason that that debate is so important um, is that that is the central resource in oil exporting countries. And so if you take something like the Iraq oil law right now, which is, um, has had no debate at all, which is completely secret, and which contrary, I think, to some of the things that were said yesterday, was largely written by foreigners that has some of the worst terms I've ever seen um, in terms of equity about what belongs in Iraq and what belongs to foreigners and what the relationship should be for foreign oil companies. That's just not a formula for more stability or more democracy. So the first thing is, you know, real debate inside about what is the central resource of, of, of countries and any way to encourage that, it seems to me, is important um, for the just distribution of what that means. And outside, I think, it is an increasing understanding that if we do not, you know, we can either fight with China over scarce resources or we can cooperate. Um, we can either militarize um, and build military bases in West Africa along the pipelines, which is exactly what is happening right now, and make um, and militarize in Nigeria and other places, or you can find more just, more peaceful, and more fair ways, as I said, to distribute the costs of um, energy. And without going into the ways I, s I, I actually have written about, that seems to me to be the, the real choice facing us. Um, I, I'd also like to say just a, a brief word about what we could do. And um, I, I'm, I don't like intervening in um, the politics of other countries unless we're asked to intervene. So um, I would say stay out unless you're asked to go in. And second of all, I think that if we do not like the politics of a particular country and we find that they're anti-democratic or uh, are oppressive of their population or whatever, then we don't do business with them even if they have oil. So I, we have to be, we have to, you know, decide what's more important to us. Do we care so much about how politics is organized in other countries? Do we care so much about democracy? Or do we mo mostly comp care about uh, uh, profits? And so that's, um, uh, that's my take on what we should do or not do. Yeah, I think I probably uh, agree with you, especially because I'm being trained in Chicago. I mean, in general, I don't like even government intervention in general, not, as, not, as, not even to say uh, uh, at, at, at the international level. And, but if for any reason we believe that uh, uh, there's some externality in terms of uh, having a lot of uh, non-democratic government around, then I think the right thing to do is just to think about other alternative sources of energy so that, because if, if I think we, ag we agree that 
oil wealth imposes a challenge for a democratic transition. And if oil wealth is a problem, then if we somehow have some other source of energy, then oil wealth is, is going to be less valuable, and then they're going to, I mean, they're going to solve their own problem instead of if we have some other government intervene. Even, I mean, there are some people suggesting that we, we should make sure that they, they do things, uh, transparency account, uh, uh, accountable and stuff like that. It's very costly and difficult from a third party to, 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 to help out and do that kind of, that kinds of thing, I think. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Let's turn it over to the audience. Um, hello again. Uh, thanks, of course, for coming and talking about these uh, important issues. Um, and I would also like to apologize, you know, for having to be the annoying butthole who held up the time <laughs> cards. Um, this, uh, this question is directed to uh, Dr. Carl. Um, black gold is a problem, but what exactly can countries uh, around the world do to accommodate these humane concerns if the world needs oil to operate? Well, there are a lot of short-term things and there's some longer-term things. And I would say that the short-term thing is it re really matters how you, I mean, let me pre preface this by saying black gold isn't anything. It's just a viscous liquid. Um, it doesn't have any meaning, good or bad. Um, the best, mo most spectacular uh, development outcomes in the world, in the top of the UNDP index every year is Norway, which is an oil exporter. Um, and the worst is down, down at the bottom are, you know, Chad, Sudan, and some other oil exporters. So it in itself, to me, doesn't have so much meaning. Let me just make that really clear. I think there are ways, however, if you looked at the, the grievance structure that I raced through really fast, in every one of those places, there are really important things to do right now that would change um, how difficult I mean, that would change the in enormous footprint. I wouldn't even say footprint. What, do you, what, do you, what would you call a dinosaur print or something that, that companies leave? Let me, let me give you an example. Um, if you applied the same environmental regulations that we have in the United States to Ecuador, to Chad, to the Sudan, to any places where U.S. oil companies operated, you would not have the huge spills in the Ecuador Amazon that have just absolutely destroyed uh, miles and miles and miles of rainforest, which matters to us, actually. Um, you would not have that picture I showed you in the Niger Delta. It wouldn't look like that. So um, one of the things that's really important is um, regulating the industries, whether they're national oil companies or uh, foreign oil companies, to behave with really strong standards in, I would say, both environmental and other forms of, of human rights. Um, there are a range of other things that go along with that that have to do um, with, and, and there are a lot of things that go along with that. There are, there are disease patterns that I can track to oil, absolutely. There's an AIDS epidemic that follows the Chad Cameroon pipeline, for example. Um, um, there are many other things like that that are really important and that actually much more responsible corporate management could do something about. So there are things that are very, and I can give you many, many more examples. I don't want to talk too long about this, but I, that, that's one set of things that could happen now. My own belief is that whether we like it or not, and no matter how much oil is out there, the tremendous um, social, environmental, and um, war costs associated with the way we organize our economies today is going to force us to change. And so I would only, it, it's going to force us to change regardless of, of whether you believe in peak oil or you don't or how much oil is in the ground. There are things that cannot, that are not being quantified in these talks, uh, in, in these economic analyses about the costs of not having democracy, the costs of environment, the costs of human rights violations all over, the costs of four million dead in the Congo over, over oil and other mineral wealth along with other factors, et cetera. These are just huge costs. And so I think that we are going to be forced to make a transition, and as I said before, the real issue is, is that going to be an orderly, cooperative, and fair transition where all actors involved, the producers, the consumers, the companies, 
um, the populations involved, try to share that cost in some way so that none of us get hit too hard from it as we push for something cleaner, or is it going to look worse? I've got a, a kind of a follow-up question on that about what the appropriate policy response should be, because so far the, the, the answer for governments and for companies has been about standards. You know, the equator principles don't, don't lend unless the project meets certain standards. Uh, extractive Industries Transparency Initiative will all agree to a certain level of disclosure, voluntary principles on security, you know, we won't associate with government's militaries in a particular way. Um, and so my question is, is for Professor Carl and Professor Lowy, different ones. For Professor Lowy, I guess the question is, if leadership is really the core issue and the host governments don't choose to set these standards for everyone who operates there, are these initiatives worthwhile or do you think that they're a superficial policy response? And then for Professor Carl, because you, in a sense you've, said, you've already said that standard setting is a good way to go, but then how do you deal with the problem of Nigeria may be setting different standards for U.S. companies than they might send for Chinese companies. How do, you, how do you broaden those standards or deepen them in a way that they're effective? That's a, that's a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, are these initiatives worthwhile? Um, if, they are, if they are imposed seamlessly, they are. For example, you know, a country like Algeria does want foreign companies in there developing their oil reserves. If it knows that you're not going to get involved unless Sonatrack uh, opens up its books to the public to look at, they're out of, they're out of business. So I think if you're, I, I mean, uh, uh, they can go elsewhere, yes, but there, if there could be an international imposition of these kinds of regulations, I think that would be, I think that's the direction that we should be trying to move towards. And I think, um, I think that, that, you know, I'm thinking out loud now. I haven't thought about this very hard. Um, but I think that that might be a win-win situation, okay, um, in, the, in the medium term. Um, I think that for a while, perhaps, you would get Sonatrack going elsewhere to countries that are, don't give a damn about such initiatives. And, um, but I think if somehow the United States or whoever, uh, if there were an, an international effort to impose such things, that would be a great way to go. And I guess what I would add to that is, you know, I, uh, I'm very mixed on these initiatives. And um, the main reason is I just don't believe in voluntary standards. I think they have to be mandatory. And if they're not mandatory, someone's going to break them. <laughs> um, and there have to be consequences if you break them. And so I, again, I would underline what Miriam says. The, this needs to be international but mandatory standards. And I think you shouldn't be able to be listed on a U.S. stock exchange, for example, unless you, have, you, you, you conduct business in a certain way so that you can create actual economic incentives. Um, the example everybody says is the Chinese won't play. Well, I, I'm not so sure about that. The Chinese are getting more and more integrated. They're finding, they don't want their people kidnapped either, I can guarantee you, um, uh, in, in the kinds of places that I've been working in. And so I would favor very strongly um, mandatory transparency in both what uh, companies pay governments and how governments spend them, number that, 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 that issue. But I have to say that transparency isn't nearly enough because you can have things be transparent, but if you work in Angola and nobody can understand the accounts um, because of the, or, or in Chad, because the, there's, there's three economists in the country, <laughs> um, you have to have more than that. This has to be coupled with, I think, a really um, with very serious campaigns inside countries about what this wealth means, what its prospects can be, um, and, and, and I'll give you some examples. I've seen situations in which, uh, in, in, in where a, a particular village is given a stipend, and they say, by, in this case, by an oil company, and they say, you know, we, we were going to give it to you to build a school, but we don't really know because some people want 
a clinic and some other people want this and some people want that. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is they get this stipend and they sit down and they debate what they want in the village. And it has to become a public good instead of a private good. And you get a whole village talking about what is its first order of priorities in the list of incredibly, I mean, they need everything, so who knows how you make this priority. They tend to go, in the cases I've seen, for something that involves their children. But, you know, it's the beginning of a step of turning um, a rent into what is a much more long-term human resource. Thank you all for doing really great presentations, uh, really enjoyable. I had a question kind of based on some of Dr. Carl's concerns uh, that she brought up. I mean, the kind of the con consensus that I've been uh, seeing here is one that kind of revolves around leadership in these countries and that, you know, whether it's Putin or Russia, that, you know, we really need to apply these standards uh, to these countries. A lot of tears have been spilled about Russia in particular. Uh, I won't get into why I cynically not so sure about that. Uh, but I mean, the take-home message has been that it's effectively the fault of the people in these countries. And so I was wondering, uh, Dr. Lally brought up in the beginning about historical legacies and kind of left it at that after colonialism. That, you know, I, I was wondering how things much have really changed with resource development. And as we're looking at the Canada and Norway, kind of this democratic bar at the top, mm -hmm. you know, kind of stay the same. Well, they're also never colonized either. I mean, there's other factors that work here too. And I was just, you know, wondering, we have about 900 odd military bases around the world. You know, I was wondering how much these things have really changed and how much it's just the fault of these people in these countries, whether there's something really that wrong with them or whether there's something that's also a little wrong with us. Thanks. Um, you know, I just want to remind you that the incentive of the imperial powers to go into, col to, to have colonies in the first place was, on the one hand, to have these resource extracting hinterlands and they cre it turned them into resource extracting hinterlands. So remember that, that you know, that's what their role was uh, originally as colonies. And, um, and, and this is something that, you know, this, this has affected uh, much of the developing world having had this colonial experience. And so there's a whole um, set of um, uh, ways in which uh, 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 colonies that have been developed as resource extracting hinterlands have been affected over time. Um, and, uh, and then the discovery of oil more recently has, has, has just reinforced that. Um, and, 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 and this is something that much of the developing world that had been colonized has to deal with, has to deal with the long-term effects of having been developed in this way. And there was a polit political development that went along with this sort of economic development, right? The infrastructure was, was built up in such a way that it would promote getting the resources out of the, the colony, et cetera. So, I mean, there's this, there, there, you know, much of the efforts of the post-colonial states has been to kind of resolve these issues of, of dependency and underdevelopment related to the colonial experience.